I'd like to talk to you a few minutes about the SFMA, the Selective Functional Movement Assessment. Now, you can probably look in the movement book or even find on the internet the seven top tier movement patterns that we look at. And a lot of people think if they just do those seven patterns that they're doing the SFMA. Actually, you're not. You went through the front door, but you're not even close to the living room yet because we've got to make a lot of decisions based on these movement patterns. Now, we might have a neck pattern, a shoulder pattern, a spine pattern bending forward, backward, rotation, squat, whatever. Don't think about the patterns right now. Think about the distribution of the way the patterns can go. Let's say uh, we're looking at a toe touch right here. Can you or can't you? And if you can, does it hurt? And if you can't, does it hurt? So as we start looking at movement patterns, we have this one that's painful, uh, but you were able to cover normal range of motion. There's nothing in your motion that needs to be fixed other than the fact that it hurts. So it is functional and painful. We get to another pattern where you can't even cover your range of motion that we consider normal. That's dysfunctional, but it's non-painful. And then we could keep going through. This one's functional, non-painful. That's largely normal. This one's dysfunctional and painful. And if we started looking at these movements like bending forward, bending backward, squatting, reaching back, turning to the left, we would immediately get this neat little distribution. Why is that important? because it doesn't take long in rehabilitation research to see that we should all be very aware of regional interdependence. And that's where one part of a body not functioning the way it should can actually put an unnecessary load on another part of the body that then becomes symptomatic. It's very easy for clinicians to chase the pain and chase the symptomatic pattern. Why? Because we've got a client or a patient there sitting there saying, but it's my knee, but it's my knee. I know, and I'm gonna look at your hip and I'm gonna look at your ankle and I'm gonna look at the way your spine moves to make sure it's only your knee. And if I do see complicating factors, we're gonna see if they have any relevance to what's going on in your knee. I see the same problem with somebody saying, it hurts when I forward bend, but I wanna see you stand on one foot. What's that got to do? This is what hurts, not that. However, if you can stand on this foot for 10 seconds and can't even get on this foot for three, maybe your balance on this foot has a contributing factor to your pain in forward bending. Let's say it doesn't. I can easily do something to help your balance here because you didn't have poor balance because you were in pain here. You just had poor balance. So I can take the same knowledge that I would do to help you with balance on this side if that were your major problem, do a little balance retraining for a few seconds, juice your balance on, on this side. I know it's not gonna stay. I know by the time you get to the parking lot, it'll be gone. But if I can get you to about 10 seconds of balance on this side, we can revisit those patterns that are both dysfunctional and provocative for pain and see if that makes a difference. And that's how to really prove if one of these things is complicating one of these things. Can we do it in less top tier patterns? I wouldn't advise it. I tell people the same thing about the movement screen or the Y balance test or the SFMA. If we could do this in less moves, we would. We know time is valuable to everybody, but what's more important to us is we want to be effective. We know if you're effective at finding movement problems, you're going to get more efficient getting through this. So if you've been doing the SFMA for two years, it comes right out. It is done automatically as part of your standard operating procedure. If you're new to the model, it seems like we spend more time evaluating than treating. We don't, but on that first day, a large chunk of time is more about aiming than shooting, and hopefully we miss less than we would without a tool like this. Now. We've got those top tier patterns. We see all the things we don't even need to look at. Okay, so these are not even problems. But I've got a dysfunction right here, and I've got a pain provocation right here. Now, we know this pattern, and we know some special ways we can look at this pattern. The spine behaves differently standing than it does laying down. We call these positions loaded and unloaded. And so if we break out your movement behavior into different areas like this, man, this starts looking complicated and confusing. But if you just follow that flow chart, you will quickly arrive at a question that you can't answer at the top tier. You want to know what it is? If this is dysfunctional and painful, 
or if this is dysfunctional and non-painful, it doesn't really matter. If I break that out, I still don't know if it's dysfunctional because it's a mobility problem or a motor control problem. You think you know? A lot of times when we take you off your feet, say in a forward bend where you can't get all the way down to your toes and put you in a long sitting position, sort of like that, you can touch your toes, yet standing up, you can't. What changed? Your spine still has a load on it, but your hips don't. Your movement pattern just changed because you changed the orientation of your body. Now you're gonna see this distribution if you look for it. Some people are gonna have a consistent limitation in this position or that position. That's pretty much a mobility problem. Regardless of your body position, we don't see that changing. Whereas if you're here standing, but you're there sitting, what looked like a mobility problem on your feet just became a motor control problem because all the available range of motion I need from your spine and your hips and your calves and everything was available by changing your posture, which means that's inconsistent with what we saw on your feet, which means we play these two movements against each other and say the motion is available as long as the load is reduced. The load goes up, the motion is no longer available. So you're using things inappropriately, like maybe your posterior chain muscles sort of not weight shifting right in that forward bend. So doing a top tier and treating out based on that means, eh, you're 50-50, wrong. I'm not saying you can't change movement. You won't even know why. Because up here, you're just guessing on the anatomy that could be compromising the range of motion or the balance or the motor control. Take time to do the breakouts because if you were to know these top tiers and the distributions you have, there's only four. We can have functional, non-painful, functional, painful, dysfunctional, painful, dysfunctional, non-painful. What do we exploit and what goes largely unchecked with most of the people we work with, mentor and train, is they just let this stuff go. If it's dysfunctional but it's not painful, they don't even follow it, they're not even aware of it. Heck, I can do treatment on this thing, this stiff hip, this stiff ankle that's not even part of your symptom, very, very quickly without worrying about exacerbating symptoms and then I can recheck one of these painful patterns and see did I modulate that, did I change it or not. If I didn't, then I just proved that this dysfunction may not have any relevance on your symptoms today. But if something changed, either 100% or 50%, then this dysfunctional non-painful pattern became a sign, not a symptom. And how often in musculoskeletal medicine do we get swayed by symptoms, not clinical signs? I'm telling you, when you're standing there with your physician talking about the way your heart feels, you want as many signs and symptoms because there's a lot of things that can give you chest pain. A few of those things are completely different and maybe even more important than the other. So we're gonna look at a lot of other things as well. In movement, oh man, we're largely driven by symptoms and it's time not to do that anymore. So when you've got the top tier, you came through the front door of a completely different movement perspective. But if you stop there, let's just call it entertainment value only. You've got to run these breakouts and you've got to look at the left and right side independently and you've got to look at the body loaded and unloaded. And if you'll look how we do that distribution, it's exactly what you have figured out on your own if we said, prove to me the forward bend limitation isn't hamstrings or is low back or isn't low back and is hamstrings. And you'd know these breakouts in long sitting, in leg raising, and you could easily sort of put the crosshairs on the body part that's limiting. And many times, we'll break one of these patterns out and find no limitation whatsoever. Well, that means we don't have a mobility problem. We've got a motor control problem. Timing, sequence, coordination, synergy of the way you use your body. So even though you've got all the parts in the available motion, you cannot produce the pattern. What pattern? Fundamental patterns that you use in every activity and some of the same fundamental patterns you use to teach yourself to walk the very first time. When we created the SFMA perspective, there's two different perspectives. One, distribute standing patterns into four categories, and then 
find as many dysfunctions as possible that aren't related to the symptoms because that in lies the combination to truly proving individual case by case regional interdependence. So you cannot tell me with a degree of certainty that I feel comfortable with, are you flunking or in pain on these problems because of mobility and motor control until you do the breakout? So embracing the SFMA and not doing the breakout means you didn't truly embrace the SFMA. So please look at the breakouts, look at the way we, we sort of get to our treatment problem. And for those of you that are looking for a little more clinical mentoring, this is a model that does that. Because what is it? It's a feedback loop. I can lay this down the first day and revisit any of these things with my treatments, with my exercises, with my recommendations, and see relevance. And there's one other perspective I want you to know about. Early in my career, I realized that sometimes what the patient told me wasn't consistent with their signs. I could make a lot of progress with them, but they would come back the next day, the complaints are up, the symptoms are up, but yet single leg stance and forward bending is actually better. What do I say? Hey, we were pretty aggressive the other day and, and we had a really good session and I'm very, very sorry that, that you're sore or uncomfortable from that, but let me tell you something, we're covering marks we didn't cover the first day. 90% of the time, that's all they need to hear. My investment and my discomfort is yielding great dividends on movement. And usually within two or three days, these people retain the movement, but the symptoms diminish. What about the flip side of that? They come in, give you a big old bear hug, bake you a, a tray of cookies, their movements are worse, their balance is worse, two other patterns got worse, okay? Emotionally, they like the connection. Obviously, you're a likable person. Maybe they're having a good day because they just got a winning lotto ticket. However, from a movement perspective, they're getting worse and they're getting worse on your watch. If you based everything you feel about your treatment on the way they treated you today, the one that gave you the cookies is the treatment you would continue, and the one that's complaining is the treatment you wouldn't, and they should be inverted. Stick with what's changing the signs and adjust the load so the symptoms aren't exacerbated, but just because somebody's having a good day doesn't mean they're moving better. We have the technology to tease that out, and if you don't lay the baseline down the first day, you don't get the feedback, and if you make a huge difference, it's going to be hard to prove you get the credit for that. So look a little bit deeper into the SFMA. Realize it's one of the perspectives that's really changed the way we look at rehabilitation, but it lines right up with everything research is telling us. We need to do more head-to-toe movement assessment, movement analysis, and we definitely, if we're looking at injury recurrence and people coming back for rehab because it's incomplete, it's because we're leaving this on the table. Most of the time, we often discharge people with less symptoms. But if they have the same level of dysfunction, and we know movement dysfunction causes compensation, substitution, bad movement habits, then we got a problem. If you truly believe that movement dysfunction is a driving force between symptoms that come on later, and you're not taking clinical opportunities to map that out, I got one question for you. If not us, who will? For more information, visit functionalmovement.com.